first talk is uh, uh, from a couple of friends at Igalia, uh, past and future of server-side runtimes, from Andreo Botella and Nicolò Ribaudo. Please come on stage, guys. <laughs> hey, don't trip yourself. <laughs> Great, folks. And yay, go for it. I'm Nicolò and Darren Andrea. Andrea. Hi. Uh, okay. Yeah, so as Matteo said, we'll be talking a little bit about the past and future of server side runtimes. Oh, well, does it work? No, okay. Uh, <laughs> and well, like we are not comfortable we'll know what server side JavaScript is. And like nowadays, we have so many different server side runtimes, like there are a bunch of them, but there are new runtimes coming up every couple of months. Uh, but like, let's look at the original one uh, that's not Node. Uh, like, if we Look about what there was before Node. We see that JavaScript was run on the server uh, since, like, basically when JavaScript existed. Like, those are two examples, uh, like Liveware from Netscape or others. Uh, and like, nobody talks about this anymore. Uh, but like, they were like the, the engines that first brought JavaScript to the server, uh, and they had all something in common uh, that were completely different from like how Node.js is nowadays and how all the other runtimes work. Uh, they were more similar to PHP, maybe. Uh, like, you were embedding some JavaScript in HTML, uh, and like that was then executed to replace some pieces of the HTML. Uh, you had one thread per request, so you didn't have to worry about like handling uh, requests asynchronously. You just had your HTML file with some JavaScript. Uh, the server was running that file in a thread synchronously and like getting the result at the end and sending that to the browser. And they all provide the utilities like for file system, for databases, and like trying to write that is actually like trying to write code in like PHP, as I said. Uh, but like let's look at a concrete example. Uh, JAXA. Uh, it was created 15 years ago by a company uh, called Aptana. It, they now work on editors. It's not maintained anymore. And originally it was closed source, but when they stopped maintaining it, they like they published the code on GitHub. I tried building it to try to get it running. Good luck with that. I couldn't figure out how to do it. However, they have a website that's not available anymore, but in the, it's in the Internet Archive. And I managed to download the executable and try to get it run, because it was fun. Like, my first server-side runtime was Node, and I wanted to know what there was before. Uh, and we actually have it running here. Uh, like, I have a Windows machine, uh, and like, we can see how JavaScript looked uh, in practice. I have this very small uh, application. It's basically all client-side. Oh, let me load. There is a button just to increase a number. Uh, and like, this is all client side. If you look at the source, we can see that, we can see that uh, like there is the, my empty H1 element with the JavaScript code that's then populating it and updating when I click the button. Like, what if I wanted to move some things to the server? Uh, like, this is obviously not a realistic example, but like it, it gives the idea. Uh, well, in all of them, there was some way to mark how, where script tags had to, had to run. Uh, so, oh, thanks, you, Scott. Uh, so, like, I could split my logic in two because, like, obviously, click handlers need to live on the client, uh, but like, some logic could run on the server. Uh, specifically for Jaxter, I have to say, I run at server. Uh, depending on which one you use, there was a different way to mark code. Uh, well, this uses jQuery, so I need to also run jQuery on the server, uh, and. It always worked. Uh, I just have to say, I want to run this bot on the client and the server. And all, the, all these runtimes were basically just running a browser engine. So HTML was there, uh, and all the front-end libraries could already work server-side. So let's try running these, and let's see if it still works. Yes. Uh, and now, like, it li looks exactly the same. But if we look at the HTML code this time, sorry, it was too small before. If you look at the HTML code this time, now this 7, it like server side rendered. Uh, I'm requesting this to my app, uh, and the engine is working there. Uh, and they have utilities like to read files. So here I could read this from a file, for example. Uh, there is a jaxer.file.read API, and I pass the, I pass the file path. Uh, but as I mentioned, everything here is, a, is like, they didn't need to worry about asynchronous code, uh, because they, like, it was a single request per thread. Uh, so if I'm to run this in a set timeout, for example, uh, let me. Mm -hmm. well, let's see, 100 milliseconds, and I try to see the result, 
this just doesn't work. This coordinate map never runs because, well, because it finishes running JavaScript code, it takes a snapshot of the HTML and it sends it to the browser. Mm, uh, you should try zero also. Uh, time out or zero. Oh, yeah, I mean, time, time out is always asynchronous even if you use zero, so it still doesn't work. Uh, so, like, it was JavaScript, but with some limitations. Uh, and then we had all these, like, runtimes, and then not came to change, like, to change the paradigm. Yeah, so, um, in just the span of, a, uh, in the short span of a few years after Node.js uh, was released, it quickly became the go-to server-side platform, and pretty much overtaking uh, all of the previous uh, runtimes that we saw. And I want to explore why. Uh, the, like, it's obviously not because you had uh, the, same, uh, like the same language uh, as the client side, uh, because all of these previous runtimes also had it. So uh, in order to understand why, we need to take a look at the state of HTTP servers around 2009. The dominant server, by and large, was Apache, which used blocking I.O. with threads. We'll dig a bit deeper into that. Uh, in the next slide. And there were two main kinds of server-side languages, um, two main categories. One was PHP, ASP.NET, anything uh, that was using CGI and FastCGI, which had a separate execution for every request. And uh, like, uh, if you define a global variable or something like that while processing one request, it will not be available at the next one. And it used blocking I.O. Then there's things like Java and Ruby, which uh, usually spin their own, well, they spin their own servers usually with some uh, uh, framework to not have to worry about the server code itself. And they use blocking I.O. with threads. If you notice Jaxer and this uh, pre uh, previous run in servers, in like JavaScript runtimes were uh, in this uh, first category with PHP. And this, all of these things, uh, all of these servers and server-side languages can basically struggle to handle uh, uh, many concurrent request, uh, uh, yeah, many concurrent connections. Uh, at 10K, this became uh, a problem. Uh, it was starting to become a problem at that time, and it was called the C10K problem. So the reason for this is that blocking I/O is well, is the default kind of I/O in most languages and operating systems. And I/O is incredibly slow from the CPU's perspective. And network re requests are slow. It, but even file reads can, can take thousands of, of CPU clock cycles that could be spent on something else. You can use threads to uh, continue processing tasks at the same time that you're doing I.O. And this is what servers had to, to do to not uh, wait uh, so, so long for, for the I.O. But starting a thread takes some amount of time. Each thread takes a fixed amount of memory, like the stack. Uh, you can reduce the size of the stack, and they all suck up. And once you have a lot of threads, and uh, in even across many processes, the uh, OS task scheduling uh, gets uh, slows down because the operating system has to figure out how to share the actual cores across those threads. For a server to continue accepting connections, it needs to have at least as many threads as concurrent connections at this point in time. It usually needs, uh, like, it usually uses more because of thread pooling to avoid having to start a thread every time. But uh, with enough concurrent connections, the OS just can keep up. So what if you could tell the OS to start some I.O. but not block? Uh, you, the OS could have a queue of input-output messages. It just pu uh, pushes to that queue whenever some, uh, some I.O. operation has finished running or there is some, some update. And you would call a function that would get you the next message in the queue. Your application code would run inside a loop in response to these I.O. messages, in, in response to these events. And this is what an event loop actually is. Uh, you, uh, JavaScript developers uh, don't, uh, like, the term is a bit opaque to JavaScript developers, but it is simply this, this kind of loop and the JavaScript code running in, inside the, the loop body for, for each of the kinds of events. And uh, there are some complications with microtask, the Node.js event, uh, event loop, but those are all things that go inside the, the loop body, pretty much. And even a single-threaded event loop can easily be m way more performant than blocking I.O. and threads if your code is, uh, does not do heavy computation, uh, if it's mostly uh, uh, using I.O. Uh, and Node.js uh, was a runtime that intended to solve this problem. 
and it did so by using JavaScript, which was designed for an event loop. So uh, like uh, it was used in the browser in, uh, in an event loop. Most JavaScript developers were used to that. And so uh, Node.js was uh, used something that uh, Ryan Dahl later called force optimization by uh, forcing the developer to be in an environment in which there is no blocking IO, you're, you're forced to, be, to run inside this loop. And uh, yeah, uh, this was done that way to force the developer to, do, to have performance service. It's, there's no blocking IO until uh, node, in, uh, node uh, 0 0.1.30. Uh, introduce it, introduce file synchronous IO. Uh, oh well. But why it's required only synchronous then? Uh, because uh, Node still has asynchronous uh, yeah. file. Yeah, cycle. like if Node wants to have everything as thing, why this happened? Well, the reason is standards. Uh, how many of you know what server.js is? Okay, well, it was renamed, renamed after, shortly after being created. So how many of you know what common.js is? Uh, actually, are you sure? Spoiler, it's not just required. Uh, and like, even if now everybody thinks about require when thinks about when thinking about common JS, uh, it was an effort uh, to standardize server side platform. Uh, started around 2009 because like shortly, like uh, shortly, like very close to when Node was released, uh, and it was started by Mozilla employer. Uh, and the, the need for this was because JavaScript was highly fragmented. Uh, like there was no shared libraries for your operations, no shared way to load other files. Uh, many platforms could run browser code, but then you still needed all the platform specific code. Or like Node was not compatible with any of the other platforms. So there wasn't really a JavaScript ecosystem. You had separate ecosystems for all of the platforms. Uh, and like there are multiple efforts that started within this common JS label. Uh, well, the one that we'll know is, is modules. Uh, modules were like different in every single place. Uh, like in some platforms, you could use like script tags to include them, or like you have some uh, like in Juxta, for example, you had this load function just injected a file in the global scope. In Node, you had required include. Include was modified in the global scope, and they were asynchronous. Uh, there was this onload callback, and after the your required call was done, the onload callback would be fired. Uh, uh, so like there is this. A proposal within CommonJS called CommonJS Modules 111 uh, that wanted to fix this problem. Uh, and like, if we read at the spec, it's exactly what we know today. Uh, there is a require function that accepts that the name of a module, uh, returns some API of the imported module, and then in modules we have a require variable and exports variable. Uh, and like, there were multiple implementations, uh, such as Narval, uh, that was, it was a platform that could run within other platforms to provide uh, like a shared common JS environment. Uh, and at some point also Node.js implemented this and that's why nowadays require is synchronous and not asynchronous anymore. Uh, maybe having require asynchronous would have helped today with migrating to SM. Uh, and like there were also some attempts to make them work in the browser. Uh, AMD, uh, for example, came out of this effort, but it ended up not working very well because it had more restrictions than just running common JS on the server. And Something else that came out of CommonJS is asynchronous interfaces. Uh, Node and we now use none of those proposals, but if you try to read the promises A spec, you see that he provides a then handler uh, which takes a bunch of callbacks. And this is very similar to what we had today. Uh, this was then evolved into promises A plus, uh, which was eventually adopted by the ECMAScript standard. Uh, and fun fact, it was suggested already in 2009 that Node should have supported promises rather than callbacks. Uh, and as you know, it didn't happen. Uh, promises seem to be quite heavy syntax. Uh, also, promises were very different from what they have today, so it's probably for the best that this didn't happen. Otherwise, we might be stuck with a, with a worse version of promises rather than the good one we have now. And there were many other proposals within CommonJS, uh, like, for example, the assert model in Node, uh, was original lining with assert as defined by CommonJS. Uh, it also tried to standardize console because at the time every browser had a different console interface and all server side environments had a different one. Uh, so many of the methods on console we have today were part of the CommonJS standard. Uh, it tried to introduce workers to the server and like other proposals that like 
were then never implemented in other impl various platforms. So why we don't hear about all these proposals anymore? Uh, well, the reason is that Node won. Uh, Node won, and like everybody was using Node, all the other server side runtimes stopped being used, uh, and you don't really need a standard where there is a single player. Uh, but and, that, yeah. uh, that was 10 years ago. Things have changed a lot since then, and now there are, uh, there are a lot more uh, JavaScript runtimes with a focus on web interoperability. So why should you care about web interoperability? Well, it lets you reduce code between the server side and the client side. Uh, just like if you just use uh, APIs that are common, uh, then you don't have to, like you can just reuse the code. You don't need to use polyfills like isomorphic fetch. Um, the, the learn ones right anywhere. Uh, the developer muscle memory. Uh, you have a single uh, common documentation that you can just look uh, on MDN, and uh, if, even if you're using, I don't know, uh, fetch on, on Node. And uh, having, uh, like, having runtimes be interoperable with the web means they become interoperable with each other, which reduces locking. So Node.js, uh, well, in, in 2009, when Node.js uh, uh, started, the web had very few non-DOM APIs. And the focus of Node.js in the beginning was not to, web to be web compatible, but still, it uh, supported set time and set interval from the very beginning, and console.log was supported since uh, version 0.2 uh, in, in 2010. Now, over time, uh, along the history of Node.js, the web gained many web APIs that could indeed be used in, in, in the back end. And Node.js was a bit slow to, to adopt them, but it, it is finally getting there. Uh, there was ESM, uh, which uh, is now finally supported by default after so many years in progress. And there has been uh, a shift in the existing, there, uh, there are newer runtimes, which uh, all take after noting that they all use non-blocking IO in an event loop in the same way. Like that really changed the game. The, they usually have some extent of compatibility with Node.js and NPM because of the sheer amount of packages that rely on that. They uh, used ESM by default, like really uh, adopting the, that standard, and they are heavily invested in, in web interoperability. But it's interesting to see that modern runtimes and pl platforms bring new uses to existing web APIs. Uh, if you use uh, uh, Cloudflare workers or, uh, uh, well, Dino.serve, you have HTTP fetch handlers that take in a request object from the fetch API and return a response. This is similar to the service worker API in browsers, but it's not the same. And um, it's being used for fetch handlers is new. Uh, Dean also supports server-side local storage, which is uh, something that, well, uh, it's a new use for, for that. And I find it very interesting that Dino deploy Dino's uh, S, uh, platform uses broadcast channel, which in the, wo uh, in the web is an API to uh, pass messages across same origin uh, ta uh, tabs and so on. It uses it for m passing messages across instances of an application in different edge servers. So uh, with broadcast channel in the web, you can transfer shared array buffers, but that needs to be the same process. You can do that for, for uh, edge servers. And one of the things that uh, summarizes this focus on uh, web interoperability and the value that it brings you it, uh, was, is a quote from Luca Casonato from uh, a blog post about, uh, uh, about Winter CG. When using Dino, or Bun, or Cloud for Workers, you are learning new platform-specific APIs or functionalities. You are investing in your knowledge of the largest and most important platform in the world, the web. Now, there are a few challenges. The differences between server-side runtimes and browsers do matter in terms of, web, uh, in terms of support for web APIs. The web specs are written uh, for browsers. Uh, they don't take into account server-side needs uh, very well. And if each runtime solve, solves these issues independently, and even if they show up to, the, uh, to talk with the spec folks independently, uh, well, we have new sources of incompatibilities across the engine. And in terms of trying to see the spec uh, cater to our needs, uh, if we show up independently, they will not listen to us as well as we, if we join together. So server-side runtimes want to extend new APIs in ways that uh, are in priority to browsers, as we kind of see here. 
And in general, we don't have a standards body which is specific to server-side runtimes. So in May 2022, engineers from various server-side runtimes, Node.js, Dino, Cloudflare Workers, and other companies involved in that space, like Bloomberg and we are uh, here, uh, created the Web Interoperable Runtimes Community Group, aka WinterCG. Uh, WinterCG is a venue for coordination across various server-side runtimes. It uh, focuses on interoperability across the various runtimes and with browsers. Uh, it also tries to coordinate uh, uh, various proposals to uh, add things to the web and JavaScript APIs uh, that will benefit server-side runtimes. And it also makes, uh, so, uh, it, this, is now, this is something that we established as of last week. Uh, we also now have a process to make some APIs which are not web APIs interoperable across server-side runtimes. Uh, we propose changes to existing specifications and plan to upstream them. We incubate, like we start working on other specifications which we then end up moving to, to uh, an, another standards body and, and publish there. And WinterCG is open for everyone to, to participate. You can uh, join the meetings and, and so on. Um, so, uh, we try to define a common set of APIs, uh, try to identify current gaps in runtimes. Uh, basically, we try to define a comprehensive baseline that you can write interoperable code against and uh, to, to reduce locking. So we're working on various things, including a common minimum API, which is basically a, a subset of uh, web APIs which should be implemented in, uh, across the board in WinterCG compliant runtimes. It, and that defines what Windows G compliant is. This is uh, still being worked on, but we have a set of APIs and uh, yeah. We, uh, the, what, the what do we achieve fetch spec, which is the, the spec that defines fetch for browsers, doesn't fully fit server side needs. You have same origin restrictions with, with cores and so on. Uh, cookies are not exposed on, on the browser. You can get the cookie or set a set cookie header because uh, there are HTTP only cookies and exposing that, uh, well, uh, the browser does not uh, expose that, but in the server you don't have a cookie jar and you need that. And it, would, it is very interesting for, for servers to, uh, for server side JavaScript to support full duplex request streaming, like uh, sending a, a, a streaming request uh, before the, the receiving server Ha, uh, well, no, uh, ha, uh, yeah, it's starting to receive the response, sorry, before, uh, the, uh, before you fully send the, the, the request. And this is something that browsers do not support or plan to support, and that would uh, not just support it, you know, supports it. It's, uh, so here we're trying to define, it, we have a fork that where we're defining requirements for different kinds of runtimes, like some requirements for browsers, some requirements for server-side runtimes, and the intent is to upstream those changes to the WG spec. We have async context. This is basically like Node.js uh, uh, async local storage, but integrated with web APIs. We're, uh, pr uh, like we're running this as a stage two TCSR9 proposal. If you want to know more about async local storage, Steven Belanger um, did a talk about this on Monday, and Dan Ember will be talking about async context, about why it can be polyfilled in, in user land, why, uh, what we're doing in the spec site uh, later today, if you want to learn more. Uh, there's Socket and Sebi, uh, um, an API for, for various connections, similar to net.connect, dino.connect. Uh, James and Aaron Snell talked about this on Monday, uh, the intent is to, ha to be server-side on only, but there is the open question that it could be useful in, in PWAs in, in the browser. And then there are some other things that we're working on, like web crypto streams, like uh, having uh, encryption and, uh, and hashing cap capabilities in a streaming manner. We're working on defining what package.json uh, package means. Then there's runtime keys, which is uh, for Conditional exports in package.json to define the various uh, the various names for various runtimes. And well, in conclusion, early server-side runtimes failed because they stuck to an outdated model, which was blocking I/O and no event loop. 
And nowadays, the outdated model is to rely on runtime-specific APIs for functionalities that also make sense in browsers. The web is not going anywhere, and it makes sense to bet on it. And it also makes sense for runtimes to push the web forward. And it makes more sense that having Node.js compatibility in all those runtimes. So uh, come work with us. We're uh, winterstg.org. All the development happens on GitHub. Join our matrix room or in our monthly calls. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. And unfortunately, we don't have time for questions. But you know, if you if you are interested in talking more about winter CG and stuff like that. Um, uh, definitely pull the guys aside. Um, I, I'm one of the co-chairs of the group, so I mean, this, this is a topic near and dear to my heart um, as well, so I appreciate it. I mean, it was a great talk. Thank you, guys. Okay, so while we're waiting for the next speaker to come up, Gil, you...